Well, hey, church, come on and stand up with us. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're so glad that you're here to worship with us. A God whose promises never fail, amen? Who is faithful each and every day. Come on, let's sing to him. Feel you. 
want to sing this together. And miracle after miracle, open door after open door, here it comes. So get ready for another one, cause another one is Another one is on the way. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we just sang, thank you that you're working all things for our good. And if we can't see it or believe this truth yet, Holy Spirit, we ask for a miracle. Would you cause our hearts to believe in your goodness, even if it's a little bit? And may that mustard seed sight's faith grow. And as it grows, may it give us hope, peace, and a curiosity to know you deeper. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, I want to welcome everyone here and those of you online to our service today. And if this is your first time here at Bayview Glen Church, a warm welcome to you. Please stop by the Next Step Center. It's just outside these doors. We'd love to meet you in person and hand you a welcome gift. And speaking of welcome gift, our Connect team has been handing these out in large numbers. We're seeing such an influx of visitors to our church. And in speaking with these visitors, a lot of them have said a consistent thing. They're saying how warmly welcomed they felt here in this community. Um, whether it was through a greeter, an usher, or a hospitality member handing them a cup of coffee. Uh, I've even talked to some people who've come back to church and remained here after many, many years of being away. And so this is all in large part to your faithful giving. Not only are we able to welcome people into our community warmly, but we're also able to connect them to the wider body of our family. Uh, if you're looking for ways to express your worship through giving, all the ways to give are right behind me. Another way that you can engage in worship is by inviting your friends and family to our upcoming Easter and Good Friday services. Uh, this is a great time to invite others to experience the sacrifice, love, and power of our God. Um, and who knows, maybe inviting one person, just one person to our services, this can start their spiritual journey of coming alive with Jesus. Uh, we have many service times to choose from, can accommodate different schedules, and all those service times are right behind me. And if you're looking for any more details, you can find it on our website at bayviewglen.org slash Easter. So before we get into the message portion of our service, I just want to invite everybody to stand. Um, this is a great time to just pass the peace to one another, to greet somebody that you haven't known or met yet. Uh, introduce yourself and pass the peace of Christ to somebody else. May the peace of Christ be with you all this Sunday. Well, I want to give you a special greeting. You are the few, the proud, and the sleepless this morning. And uh, thank you for coming and joining with an uh, hour less uh, sleep. And uh, we're grateful that you are here and grateful for those of you who are watching online. As you know, I had the privilege of growing up in the country. There's lots of advantages of growing up in a busy city and lots of different things to do. There's very different things to do when you grow up in the country. And sometimes you don't realize how good you have it until you're not there anymore. And uh, on our farm, we had uh, 100 or so acres of land. And in many of the fence rows, there were these amazing raspberry bushes. And so at certain times of year, you'd go out and you'd like gorge yourself on these fresh raspberries. Or there were blackberries in other fence rows, currants in another fence row. Behind our house, there was this grapevine. So we had all the grapes that we wanted to eat. There was a pear tree in a particular season in August go and grab pears off the tree. Dotted throughout uh, the farm were a number of apple trees. And I don't know if you've eaten like green apples, apples not quite ready. I don't know how many times I loved green apples, but they didn't love me. And uh, a little bit sick on them. And you learn after a while what's good fruit and what's bad fruit, right? What tastes really good and what doesn't. 
and how hard it is when you bite into like what looks like a really good juicy apple and there's like a big worm inside of it. And you learn a few things that the product, the fruit, is based upon the roots and the soil that it's in and the nutrients that it gets. And how good that soil and those roots are determines how good the fruit is. Also, you learn that you cannot get a pear from an apple tree or you cannot get a grape from a raspberry bush. That fruit comes from the life in the vine it's attached to. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul wants to remind us today. He's going to talk about nine things. He calls them the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to tell us there are two ways to live. We can either live apart from God. We can live according to our own rules, laws, uh, things that we want to do, separated from God. And, and that has certain fruit. He said the result of that kind of living, well, that's envy and maybe jealousy and uh, rage and uh, all sorts of other things. He said, or you can live based upon the relationship with the Holy Spirit. There's certain fruit that comes out of being connected to the Holy Spirit. And he said that's, that's like love in our life and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Self-control. And I think this week we probably said, I need more of something. Right? My guess is you might have said, oh, man, I could need more money. I need more time. I need a better job. I need a spouse. I wish I had more kids. I wish I had a better job. We look through our life and there's always something we want more of. I wouldn't doubt it, though, deep down you would say, I, I wish I had more peace. How many say, I wish I had more peace? Oh, come on, how many of you like more peace? Say, Jesus, give me peace. Jesus, give me peace. Or joy. Or a bit more love in my life. Or maybe a bit more patience. And the Apostle Paul is going to tell us how we have that in our life. And it's not by working harder. It's not by trying more. It's not by focusing on those. It's by developing our fellowship and relationship with the Holy Spirit. As Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he's going to remind us the fruit of the Spirit is not so much the works that we do, but it's the result of the Holy Spirit working through us. That the fruit of the Spirit is not a work that we accomplish. It's the result of the Holy Spirit at work through us. So I invite you to take your Bibles, and we're going to turn to Galatians chapter 5. We've been spending the last few weeks just unveiling some passages in which the Holy Spirit takes preeminence and unveiling just who the Holy Spirit is and what the Spirit wants to do in our life. And that we've seen that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, that he's not an it or a thing or a ghost, but he's a person. He may appear in kind of a spiritual form, but he has mind and intellect, will, and his desire is to empower and strengthen us and always to help us point people to Jesus. He wants to make Jesus glorified. We saw that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. He's the one that helps us form into the image of Christ. That when we walk with him, he reminds us of God's word. He speaks to us about those troubled areas of our soul. And we saw it last week that the Holy Spirit gifts us. The Holy Spirit gives us divine capabilities and enablements, enable to make a difference and really to point people to Jesus. That the Holy Spirit through us is going to use us in incredible ways to help other people see Jesus. But as we ended last week, we said the Holy Spirit's gifts are given to people who maybe aren't mature enough. And that's one of the amazing things. God gives great spiritual gifts to spiritually immature people. And we have to understand that sometimes. But the Holy Spirit also wants to mature us and grow us into the image of who Jesus is to make us like Christ. And we're going to call that the fruit of the Spirit at work. And that, that spirit and that fruit, it comes when we partner with the Holy Spirit in our life. So he's going to tell us there are two ways that we can live. We can live first by the fruit of the flesh, by being apart from God, 
are by the fruit of the Spirit. And so as Paul begins this section, I think it's important to understand it all in Galatians chapter 5. He says first, this is what it is to live by the fruit of the flesh. And he says in verse 16 of Galatians 5, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh, well, they're against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit, well, they're against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And so Paul here reminds us that that life is kind of a battle, is it not? You get up in the morning and you have your desires and God's desires. That there's things in your life you want to do that, you know, probably I shouldn't do them, but you end up doing them. And how many times you say, oh, I should do this, and you really want to do it, but you just can't get yourself to do that. And there's this battle, this war that goes on, and it goes on in my head, get up and I think, oh, things I don't want to do, and I end up doing them, other things I should do, and I don't. And Paul says there's this battle inside of us. And then we have to learn somehow, how do we do the things that we want to do? How do we have those things in our life that we really desire to do? How does that come? Paul says it comes when we walk with the Holy Spirit. And he says, when we walk with the Spirit, we will not, what? We will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh is just living apart from God, living on our own, in our own strength, and in our own power. And he says, this flesh, this body that we live in, it has desires. In fact, the word that he uses here in Greek is like big, massive, powerful desires in our life. Have you ever been overcome by a desire? Right? You're like really, really, really thirsty, and you just kind of like look for something to drink and gulp it down. Or you've been absolutely famished, right? You can't wait to eat. Or maybe there's something you really want to do. Or you just can't wait to lash out at someone. Or you want to put yourself forward to do something. Paul says there's two ways to live. We can walk by the Spirit, or we can live by the flesh and gratify all the desires that he has. And Paul goes on to talk about what some of those are. He says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh, you could also say the fruit of the flesh, well, they're evident. It's sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, all the things like that. And I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul gives us a list of what the fruit is, so to speak, uh, of just walking apart from God, what those desires really are in our life. And we look at those 16 things or so, and it's kind of overwhelming, right? You see all that list, and you're like, that's just too much. There's too many choices there. And so sometimes we just shut that out. We just move on. What's the next thing? Sometimes we look at that list, and we're really good at pointing out, oh, somebody does that. Right? I bet you look at that list, and the person next to you, you're like, well, they do that. Right? They're envious. Right, they've got a rivalry. Right, there's a little bit of enmity, hatred in it, like they just don't like stuff. It's very easy to see it in somebody else. We probably look at that list and we go, oh, well, that's not me. No orgies for me. Right, we look at that list, oh, check, I'm okay. In this long list, Paul is really talking about what happens, the fruit in our life in four different areas of relationships. The first he talks about kind of our relationship with ourselves, with our own desires, with our own things that are in there. He talks about three things. First of all, sexual immorality, impurity, and promiscuity. And so the first thing he talks about, like, is sexual immorality, which the word in Greek is pornea. It's the word we get pornography from. And and sexual immorality is is defined in Scripture as really any sexual activity outside of the covenant marriage of a husband and wife. Anything outside of that. God says, that's good. And sometimes we don't talk about, that's good. But anything outside of that, not. 
And so sometimes people stray. Sometimes they want. Sometimes that doesn't seem to be enough. Sometimes they break that covenant of marriage. And Paul says it's more than just kind of even that act. It's like impurity. It's like in our minds, in our thought life, there's other kind of activities that, that take away from the sacredness uh, of that committed bond between a husband and wife because that impurity. Jesus kind of used that in the Sermon on the Mount where he said, I tell you, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, hey, I'm going to raise the game. Like, watch out for lust. Because that can be destructive, even in your thought life. Oh, I've not cheated on my spouse. Yeah, but is there something else? And then he adds, it's like, that can kind of like ramps it up again and goes to promiscuity. Like, it's just that you've got no reference. There's no grounding in kind of the area of your sexual life. Your impulses are out of control. And basically, that's what Paul's saying. When we kind of live without God, eventually, all those desires and impulses, they begin to control us. We have no sense of, of a center being or what's right or wrong. They begin to control us. Now, we look at that from our viewpoint in 2024, and we know, well, in the Victorian era, yeah, those things weren't to do. Even in the early 1900s, we get to the sexual revolution of the 1960s, and all of a sudden, things <coughs> began to change. And we kind of have this little bit of reference that, yeah, that's probably culturally maybe not the best to do. When Paul was writing this, these were the norms Sexual immorality, impurity, it was like the norm for their culture. That was how you worshipped even. You would go to the temple and you'd offer a sacrifice and you'd sleep with someone. And sexual activity, it was how you worship. It was just the norm. And Paul says that's what happens when you just live apart from God. Your desires get the best of you. And I think many of us, we would look at that and we go, well, like, yes, maybe still in our culture, we try to be okay. We try to, like, value marriage. And yet we spend billions of dollars every year given to Hollywood to present images of what? Adultery, sexual immorality, impurity, out of control. We may not do it, but we buy it. We may not do it, but we long as voyeurs to look. Paul says that's just a fruit. There's something, a disconnect in ourself. And then he moves on and he talks about our relationship with God. And he talks about two things. He talks about idolatry and sorcery. And idolatry is when we either have kind of an image of a God where we try to bring our God down to size. And this is like the first commandment, it, you know, don't make any graven image, right? Don't bring God down to size. He's much bigger, he's bigger than what we can imagine. Or sometimes instead of God, what we do when we live out of kind of ourself apart from God is then we choose other idols. What are the things we worship? What are the things we value? What are the things that drive the way that we spend our time and talents and treasures and money? Where do we invest in trying to make our idols? And uh, Tim Keller very succinctly puts it. He says there's four real idols of the heart, four things that we want to feed, that kind of control us in our life. And I think they're true. First is comfort, right? Isn't that an idol we live by? Right, it's hard to serve God. It's easy to be comfortable. Right, we choose comfort. We choose ease. We choose what feels good. Second idol of our heart is affirmation. We want to know we matter, we count, we're important. That other people see us, know us, that we mean something. And we make a lot of our decisions about what we buy, who we spend, who we're going to be seen with, what we do, right? Based upon, does that affirm? Does that make me look good? Third idol is just control, right? We make decisions. Can I control the situation? Can I control others? Can I control my destiny? Can I control my future? We want to control. And the fourth is power. Do I count? Do I matter? And do I have power over something? 
And we may not make little idols, but oftentimes these are the idols of our heart that guide our decisions. Does it make me comfortable? Does it mean that I matter? Does it give me some control? Can I use my money, my talent, my ability, my voice, my influence for power over something? And then he says, sorcery. And most of us go, oh, check, that's not me. The word is pharmakia, from where we get pharmacy, drugs. Sorcery in that day often centered around potions or concoctions that were made to try to get people to do something or to create something or create visions and dreams to help people. That pharmacy was like drugs controlling people. And in fact, in the witchcraft, the word witchcraft in the Bible, it really, that's what it is. It's like control and manipulation of something. That anytime we really get in and outside of God's presence in our life, we try to control and manipulate things. That's kind of the very essence of what witchcraft is. And we may not do that. We may not go consult a witch, but maybe it's our horoscope. You look at the bookstores, you see the shelves on kind of witchcraft and the occult. They're expanding. Maybe it's reading of cards, a Ouija board. Maybe it's going to a psychic. There's a place I would always drive by, and it would have a sign. It would say, you know, for an appointment with the psychic, call this number. And I think, they can't be any good. Because they should know you're coming. <laughs> you shouldn't have to call ahead. But we want to find something. What's going to control? How do I know? How can I control my destiny? And then Paul goes on, the fruit of this kind of life, if we're disconnected from ourselves, if we're disconnected from God, then the fruit is all kind of relational disconnects. And then he talks about a whole bunch of things that, that happen in our relationship with others, that there's enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissension, and division. And Paul kind of starts low and kind of ramps it up. Like enmity is just when you're kind of bothered by someone. You don't like something. You don't like what they do. You can't stand them. Maybe you're frustrated with them and it gets in there. And the more you think and the more you perseverate and you don't give it to God, it becomes what strife. It becomes like a big issue between you. And then all of a sudden jealousy pops in. And what's jealousy? Jealousy is when you have something and you're afraid you're going to lose it. Right? Oh, I'm dating someone, but you're jealous, what, that maybe someone else is going to steal them away. Or that you have a good position at work, but you're jealous that someone else is going to look better than you. Or that you're known as the person, you're the guy or the gal, who, who this is your thing, but then someone else comes, and all of a sudden people begin to look at them. Jealousy is you're going to lose what you have. And then that leads in relations, what, to fits of rage. And we talked a few weeks ago, you know, anger, there's kind of righteous anger, but these are fits of rage when anger controls us, when we're out of control, when we lash out, when we don't treat people kindly, justly, or with goodness. And that leads to divisions and dissension. And all of a sudden, it's not just internal between you or it's between you and them, but, but you've built kind of alliances or allegiances with other people. And all of a sudden, there's more than one group and there's division and there's us and them and they're not working together. And Paul says, that fruit, that's in your life. That's not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's the fruit of being apart from God. And then finally, he talks about a few things. He says, this is our relationship with stuff, right? There's a relationship with, in ourselves, a relationship with God, a relationship with other people, but our relationship with things or stuff, there's envy, drunkenness, orgies, and more. And envy is different than jealousy, right? Jealousy says, I have something or someone, and I'm afraid I'm going to lose that. Envy says, someone else has something, and I want it. It should be mine. Why isn't that mine? And our whole world works on stimulating envy in our life. 
The whole marketing, advertising world is this. You don't have something that you desperately need, so get it, no matter what the cost. You need to have it. Because if you have it, it's going to fit all the idols that you have. It's going to give you comfort. It's going to affirm you that you're valued as a person because you own this. People are going to look at you. It's going to give you power or control over your life or your destiny or other people. You need to have it. And so Paul here talks about a relationship with things that gets out of control. We need to have these things. And then all of a sudden, our desires get to overwhelm us, and we're drunk, right? We talk about that, drunk with power, drunk with influence, drunk with alcohol, that all of a sudden our desires are completely out of control. We're not in control anymore. Something else is. And then he ramps it up. He says, that's just like drunken orgy, like everything's out of control. Your relationship with stuff is out of control. Your relationship with yourself is out of control. Your relationship with people is out of control. It's just like a free-for-all. It's a mess. And most of us here will go, oh, good, I don't do that. I can't tell you. It's like the most remarkable thing. How many times I have people in my office, like, confessing, right, that they're, they're, they swap spouses. Their marriage is a sham. They go on these vacations through hedonistic resorts together. And the shame that they feel and the hurt that they have. We lived in a town, O'Fallon, Missouri, when we lived there. The town right next door, kind of across the road, was Winghaven, but it was nicknamed Swinghaven. And then it was just known. People swap spouses all the time. And we looked at it and we think, how could that be? But Paul says, this is the result. And, and, and maybe living apart from Christ, it, it seems, maybe the, the result, they're not that bad. The fruit, like, yeah, that's just going to be. But eventually, it gets the best of us. And so what do we do? We put laws in place. We put rules in place. We try to check ourselves. We, we do all these things. This is how I'm going to live. We try to put restraints on us. I'm not going to have the fruit of my life apart from God. And Paul says, don't, don't live like that. Instead, you can live by the fruit of the Spirit. Your fellowship, relationship with the Spirit, it leads to something completely different. And Paul has said here, first of all, he says, remember, he says, walk with the Spirit. I love that phrase, walk. You notice many times in Scripture, it talks about walking because people didn't drive or fly or take the train or the bus. Everything was much slower. They would just walk. And if you had to get from A to B, you walked. And if it wasn't going to be a safe journey, you invited someone to go with you to protect you. And imagine the conversations you have when you're walking. Imagine what happens when you slow down. And people say, well, I just don't know how to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Well, you have to slow down and walk with them. That's what Paul says. And when you walk with someone, what do you do? You have a conversation. How's it going? What's going on? What's going on in your life? Holy Spirit, what are your priorities? What are you thinking about? What would be good for my life? And the Holy Spirit's asking us, what's going on in your life? What do you need to talk about? Where do you need some guidance or advice? How can I point you to God's Word? How can I remind you of what God's Word says? How can I give you that internal fortitude to help you do and live God's Word? And Paul says here, we don't have to walk by the fact we can walk in the Spirit, and out of that there is fruit. Now, Paul's going to name nine things. And sometimes we think, oh, Paul was a terrible grammarian because he should have said there's nine fruits of the Spirit. He said there's <laughs> the Holy Spirit fruit, and then he talks about nine things. Some suggest that the fruit of the Spirit is like this multifaceted fruit. It's like one big fruit punch with kind of different things. It's like a diamond with many facets, that all of them are part of that. That these aren't fruits that you pick and choose, and you're like, oh, good. I'm, I'm going to take patience, but I'm going to reject kindness. In fact, our own spiritual maturity 
is only at the level of the weakest fruit in our life. Because we may look at this list and go, oh, look, hey, I'm pretty good. I've got these couple. A maturity is really only at the level of the weakest one. And so Paul goes on and he names what the fruit of the Spirit is. He says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. You say you can live kind of like in a life apart from God or you can live in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and nine things happen. And there's an order. The first three, they really speak about our relationship with God. Love, joy, and peace. What God gives us. And how we respond back. That it's love. The Holy Spirit wants to remind us of God's love, God's affirmation. We have this idol of affirmation. Father says, you're forgiven. You're more than enough. I love you. You don't need anybody else's love. I love you. And out of that, share that love. Why would you envy or be jealous or, or, or be critical of someone? Like, just love them. And joy. Joy is the fulfillment of the deepest of our longings. Joy is not that everything in our life is going okay. That's happiness. There's a big difference between joy and happiness. Happiness says my happenings are all happy and good. Joy just said that my deepest desires are met. And God meets them. And when we tend to kind of look at things and say, well, I'm not very happy about that, or that kind of makes me disappointed, or I'm frustrated with that, the Holy Spirit should remind us, no, 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 no. You're forgiven. You're loved. You're empowered. You're a child of God. You're a new creation. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You've got your deepest desires met, so share that. And peace, shalom in the Hebrew, the sense of peace was that everything is as it was meant to be, that everything is set as it should be. And so sometimes we look at life and we're like, oh, it shouldn't be like this. How did this happen? God, how could you let this happen? And the Holy Spirit wants to remind us, God is still in control. God has got you. God has plans for you. God's going to bring his purposes. Don't fret. Don't get frustrated. Just rest. The power of God is with you. And Paul says, this is what happens. The Holy Spirit, when you walk with him, reminds us, oh, God, I don't think this is going well in my life. Hey, I'm going to give you peace. It's going to be as it's going to be. The first three talk about our relationship with God. The second three really talk about relationships with others. He talks about patience, kindness, and goodness. You see, if your relationship, if the Holy Spirit is reminding you again and again as you walk with him, your relationship with God is in good stead, then what can happen? Your relationship with others, it flows out of that. Right? You can be patient with others. Because you're not trying to control and manipulate or get approval from others or want something from them. Hey, if they make mistakes, if they're not good, you can be patient. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, God's patient with you. Just be patient with others. As God's working with you, he's working with someone else. And kindness. Right? Kindness, treating people as they should be treated. I think that's a lost art in our culture today. We all need to be kind. We need to tell people what to do. We need to tell them that they've messed up. And that's kind of our own control and power over manipulation. I want others to know they're messing up. I'm the one that has the truest understanding. And often we hide behind social media. Right? Let's just put there anonymously what we really think. Let's tear people down. Let's call people names. Let's not be kind. 
And you meet someone and there's everything in you that wants to lash out and not be kind and put them in their place. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, it's God's kindness that leads to mercy. Just be kind to them. And goodness is treating people well. It's right. It's how God treats us. Right? God's not manipulative. He doesn't have double standards. He doesn't tempt us with something and then not come through. God's good. And then Paul talks about two that have to deal with our relationship with ourselves. It's gentleness and faithfulness. A lot of times we're not gentle with ourselves, right? We're critical, we're self-condemning, right? We're not gentle with what we think. We harsh. Some of you say, oh, I'm harder on me than on other people. What's the Holy Spirit saying? What's the truth? And gentleness is the Holy Spirit reaching out and being gentle to other people in their lives. The Holy Spirit in us treats the Holy Spirit in somebody else gently. And faithfulness, that's a relationship with ourselves, that we're just true to the Word. We're true to who we are. We don't say things and not um, stop doing them. That, that, that we're true th- throughout what we feel, what we want, what we desire, what we do, that we're faithful and true. And then Paul ends up with the last one that really deals with our relationship with people, but our relationship with stuff, and that's self-control. Self-control. I'm able to control things. The Holy Spirit's got control. Someone else doesn't control me. Something doesn't control me. My past doesn't control me. My habits don't control me. But the Holy Spirit in me. It's more than just me gritting my teeth and it's like, okay, I'm going to try and do things as I should do them. That's not our work. It's just the Holy Spirit at work through us. Who's in control? Of those nine things, what would you say? Hey, yeah, God's Spirit's at work in my life. Or what's the one thing you're saying, hey, yeah, I'm only mature as that. I'm only mature as that. And how do we do that? That's always the question. How do we do that? And Paul here, he just says four simple things. You notice in in these few short verses, like he talks about walking, being led by, living by, and keeping step by the Spirit. Verse 16, it's walk in the Spirit. Verse 18, live by this, or being led by the Spirit. Verse 25, it's live by the Spirit. And verse, at the end of that verse, it's keep in step with the Spirit. It's a relationship with the Spirit. It's every day. Say, hey, I'm going to get up and remember, the Holy Spirit is a person God's given me inside. This is what's mind-blowing for Like, people go, oh, all the religions are the like, like there's just one God. All the gods are the same. No, 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 no other religion says the Spirit of God will live in you to fellowship with you because that's what Christ died for. Every other religion is how can you do better? Christianity says how can the Holy Spirit walk with you to live? And are you led by the Spirit? I've got a decision to make. What am I going to do? Does the Spirit lead you? Are you going to live by the Spirit? When you're tempted to say, I can't do that. I can't change. I can't love that way. I can't have joy in this situation. You can't. But the Holy Spirit through you can. And keep in step by the Spirit. The story of the Trojan Wars in Greek mythology All of those leaders, the people in the battles, they had to cruise, sail by what was known as the Island of the Sirens. And the sirens were cannibals, really. They loved to eat people, but they would disguise themselves as these beautiful women songstresses. 
And so when a ship would come by the island, the sirens would go out to the beach. They would present themselves as these beautiful women. And they sing these absolutely gorgeous melodies to woo the sailors in. And the sailors would hear and say, that's so beautiful. And I want to hear more. And then they see the women and they want to get closer. But their boats would crash against the rocks and the sirens would go out and eat them. And many a seaman was destroyed because of the sirens. So with the wars, how are people going to go by the island of the sirens? And so Odysseus, he had this great idea. Before they were going by the island, as they were getting close, he put wax in all of the, the sailors' ears, so they couldn't hear. They couldn't hear a thing. But he, he wanted to hear the music of the sirens. So he had his sailors tie himself to a mast. Odysseus was tied to a mast, ropes around him, so that he could hear and hear what the music was, but couldn't do anything about it. And so as they were going by the island of the sirens, the sailors couldn't hear a thing because they had wax in their ears, and Odysseus was strapped to the mast hearing the music, and he was yelling at the, soul, it's at the sailors, go over, sail closer to the island, we got to hear more, this is so amazing, this desire is so great, but they couldn't hear him, and he was tied to the mast, desperate to hear and fulfill a desire, but he couldn't. And isn't that like us many times? We, we know the things that we shouldn't do, but we long for them, we think about them, we contemplate on them, we desire them, and it controls us, but we, we wrap ourselves in a rule, a law, or something, so we don't do it. Jason did something completely different. Before he went sailing by the island of the sirens, he hired Orpheus. And Orpheus was the best musician known to man at the time. And so he hired Orpheus. So as they were about to go past the island of the sirens, he would start playing and he played this majestic, beautiful music. And in the background, Jason, he could hear the sirens, but you know what he noticed? He noticed they were a little off key. Their music wasn't as good because he had the real thing, something beautiful. And he kept listening to that and realizing the real thing always better than a counterfeit. And this is what Paul is saying, that we have the Holy Spirit. We can walk with the Spirit. We have the power of the Spirit. We can be led by the Spirit. We have the fruit of the Spirit. We have what God can do in our life. And that's what we focus on, not the other. And I think this is part of what Jesus had in mind when the night before he died, he said to his disciples, hey, I want you to remember me through bread and wine. And when you came in, hopefully you picked up some elements for communion. If you're watching at home, maybe you want to go grab some. Uh, just put up your hand and the ushers will bring you some if you don't have it. And Jesus said, when you gather together, I want you to eat this bread and drink this cup and remember the love of Christ, the affirmation of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I just pray that we would just realize the gift we have in your Holy Spirit that he comes to walk with us, lead us, guide us, help us to keep in step with him. And Father, I just pray. I pray that as we see and spend time with you, that we would lose all other desires because we would know the perfect fruit we have in you. Lord, teach us what it is to walk every day with you and not apart from you. And the night before Jesus went to the cross, he was having a meal with his disciples and he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And he said, this, this is my body. It's a picture. I'm the bread of life. I'm your sustainer. I'm all that you need. And he gave it to his disciples. 
And he said, whenever you gather together, take, eat, and remember. And it's remember the love that he has. Remember the joy that he gives us. Remember the peace we have because of all that Christ has accomplished. So I invite you to take that piece of bread. Let's eat together and remember him. And you can take that foil piece off the cup and Jesus also took a cup and he said this wine it's a picture of my blood poured out spilled for you it's a picture of a new covenant a new way of relationship with God a new beauty a new sense of God's forgiveness and power in us and he said when you gather together as Jesus took the cup and he blessed it he said remember Remember the love. Remember that you are forgiven. Remember that the Father does not look at you as you were, but as you are now in Christ. He doesn't remember your past. He sees your future in Jesus. That those idols of our hearts that we long for, Jesus has come to give us something better. And that we do this, we share this meal to remember we have something better in Jesus. Let's drink together. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for what Jesus has done for us, his goodness and grace. We thank you for the death that he died that we should have, but he did for us. We thank you for the resurrection life that we have that's possible because of him. And Father, I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to remember all the good gifts that you've given us. Help us to remember the true, not the counterfeit. And Lord, would our desire be for you in Jesus' name. I invite us to stand and just continue to worship our resurrected King.
Pastor Terry encouraged us to fellowship, the importance of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And as we fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit are developed in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I, I believe I missed one, but... <laughs> And these gifts are expressed beautifully by ourselves, with God, but also with one another. Like how awesome would it be to express kindness, for example, with those that we're in community with, where we're able to place other people's needs above our own and to truly love and care for our neighbor. Right? Community is so important in the Christian life. And one of the ways that we express community here at Bayview Glen Church is through our life groups. You know, life groups is a more intimate experience of church where we're able to interact with people on a life-on-life -life basis. And so I highly encourage you to join a life group and you can do so by joining the life group launch on April 14th. And you can sign up for that at our Next Step Center or online at bayviewglen.org slash events. Before we leave this place, I want to encourage you that if the Spirit of God has moved in you during the service or in this week, and you are in need of prayer, our prayer partners are going to be available after the service right up front here, where we can pray alongside with you. And this is just a beautiful way to express community as our church. And so do not be in a rush to go home, to leave. The invitation is open. Please pray with one of our prayer partners. But for the rest of us, as you leave this place, I want to encourage you, um, remember that God desires, I pray that he would remind you this week how much he desires to be in fellowship with you and how much he desires to mold you into the image of his son. Remember the fruit of the Spirit is not so much what we do, but it's an, a result of the Spirit working through us. And I pray that you would experience the power and the joy of walking in the Spirit this week. Have an amazing Sunday. God bless.